Father, we thank you once more for your gracious forgiveness of us. We know we don't deserve anything. But our, our need is the reason you give us the grace. We thank you that you love us. That through Jesus we have everything we need. Help us, Lord, to understand how grateful we need to be. That we should spend the time with you. May we hear your voice. May we follow your leading. And we thank you that you'll take us all the way. We pray now that you will guide us in our subject today. May we understand the importance of understanding it your way. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As a people, we have a lot of information. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's good for us. <laughs> because once you get a lot of information, it's kind of like a businessman who has a beautiful plush mark, a carpet in your, your business. And they walk in and they see their beautiful furniture. They see their beautiful plush carpet. And after a while, they begin thinking they're as good as their carpet. <laughs> and I'm afraid some of us think we're as good as all the information we have. But it's not about information, is it? It's what we do with it. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are specialists about certain things. We are specialists about the last day events. Oh, we study those. We get it all down. We are specialists about the final outpourings of the Spirit of God. We are specialists about the loud cry. cry. We really know lots of things. We know about the, the, latter, the latter experience in the, the latter rain. And I guess there are people who've done a lot of reading and studying and put it all together about all of this and sent out lots of information for us so we can study, so we can really know what to do about the loud cry, the loud rain. What about the early rain? I think maybe we should talk about the latter rain a little bit today to see if we know something what the information are telling us. <laughs> We're going to look at things that are very familiar with, but let's see what we have here. Let's start by saying about what the latter rain does not do. Okay? Let's understand what it does not do. First of all, the latter rain does not give us a victory over Satan and sin. So let's not look for the latter rain to do that. It doesn't do that. Number one, the latter rain does not give uh, does not give purification of the church itself. So we don't get information of victory about the sin of sin, and we do not have the purification of the sin church. We do not give. From the latter rain, the righteousness of Christ to God's people. Now, it's kind of interesting, all the things we don't get. 
at the latter rain. I have some papers. I'm going to try to look at just a couple of things to see about here. What does the rain, the latter rain, give us? It says it prepares the saint church for the coming of the Son of Man. The preparation of the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This is in Testimonies to Ministers 506. Now, the question is this. Who is the church? If God is going to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man, it must mean all of the church that's alive, who's alive when Jesus comes. So whoever it is who's involved in this are people who've already come into the true church. It's not just the denomination. It's not just the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's true to the true people of God. The true people of God. The latter reign has to do something to get the people right to the place so Jesus can be ready. So whatever happens right at that last minute, something has to happen before that time. All right. So the first thing we need to see is that the latter rain ripens the harvest. Okay. It ripens, uh, ripens the harvest. The latter rain gives the world the last warning. Now, we might come into this later, but if that last moment of time is to warn the world, that has nothing to do with the church. The church is warned before the latter rain comes. See? The early rain comes during the early rain. So let's hold on to something here. The early rain has something to do with the church. The world has a last warning that's in the latter rain. All right, now, The latter rain gives power to the loud voice of the third angel. Power for the third angel. The angels reinforce the remnant people. Now again, something has happened before this time. This is happening before this time. There's a little sentence, a little clause in Acts of the Apostles, page 55 and 56. It says, unless the members of God's church today have a living connection with the source of all, all spiritual growth, they will not be ready for the time of reaping. Unless they keep their lamps trimmed and burning, they will fail of receiving added grace in types of, times of special need. Added grace will be added. Added grace in the time of the latter rain. Now, I hope you're hanging in here with me because something is happening at the time of the latter rain that's very important. At the uh, end of uh, page 56, 
It says they will receive a miraculous fitting up for soul winning. They are yielding themselves daily to God that he may make them vessels meet for his use. Daily they are witnessing for the master wherever they may be. At the end of it, it says he will grant them the presence of his spirit. That little word presence is one we will face as we come along here. The presence of his. Who's the his? It's Jesus. The presence of his spirit will have something to do with the latter rain. All right. In early writings, page 85, the commencement of the time of trouble. When do the people have that period of the time of trouble? This is not the time of trouble, the great time of trouble. This is the short time of trouble. The latter rain, the loud cry, the third angel finishing, all of these things happen before the close of probation. So the loud cry, the latter rain, all happen in a little short period of time. Now, there have been pe people all through our history who have said, oh, the latter rain is falling. That's not true. The latter rain comes in that short time of trouble. Now, Ellen White has said something that has confused people. She has said, we are in the time of the la latter rain. Now, what does that mean? We are in the time. Well, that means since 1844, we have been in the time where the latter rain could happen, any time during that period of time. But it doesn't actually happen until the, the time of trouble, the short time of trouble. Okay? So there shouldn't be any confusion here. 1844, we've been in the time. Short time of trouble is when it happens. Okay, so we have something very important in earlier writings. I want to read the statement here that we need to understand. It says, it's a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At the time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Did you catch that? It's the same word we read before, the presence of his spirit. The presence of his Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and to prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues should be poured out. So there are very important things going on in these sentences. The Spirit of Jesus, according to the book of Revelation, he has one foot on the land and another foot on the sea, which means he is in control of the whole earth at this time, doing something with his people by his presence. Okay? All of this is happening before the plagues fall. Early writings 271. This is a very important th place in uh, early writings. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled. More angels. They, the people of God, they were clothed with an armor from head to their feet. Can you see it? You're going to be with armor and extra angels in this short time of trouble. So there's something special going on here. Last time we talked about severe conflict. Well, that's in this quote. It says the people will have the armor, they will be having a severe conflict. Severe. 
And then it says, the agonizing struggle they had passed through. You know anybody having a severe agonizing struggle right now? <laughs> yeah, there are some. It's not the people smiling, saying hallelujah, and they've got it all down. It's somebody else. The number of this company, the ones who are agonizing, the ones having this severe conflict, it says the numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out. The careless and the indifferent. Indifferent? That's what it says. They're indifferent. They were left behind in darkness and their places were immediately filled by others. Are you getting this? Before the latter rain falls, we are going to lose Seventh-day Adventists who've been going to church all along. And in that short time of trouble, from the world in the last warning, they'll come and take their place. And they're going to do something that the Adventists didn't do. And we're going to find out what that is. At the bottom of 271, I heard those clothed with the armor speak. What's that? <laughs> They're not sitting around going to church and having a good time. This says the ones with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. And Ellen Wyatt said, well, what's happened here? What's made the difference in these people? This power, the angel said, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. The presence of Jesus. The loud cry of the third angel. Now, we are just sneaking up on our subject just now. We've already found out when this is going to happen. It's the short time of trouble. Something comes before that short time of trouble. The image of the beast has been formed. What is the image of the beast? Well, we immediately answer, oh, that's the United States. Well, okay, that's part of it. The image of the beast is another Catholic church. And what is it that we look for in the Roman Catholic church? It's the enforcement of a religious principle. The United States are going to enforce something religious. They're another Catholic church. So they are going to be both a religious and state system. We've been looking at it only as a political thing. No, that's not the image of the beast. The image of the beast does something religious. What is it? The image to the beast, does always. Persecution. Persecution. If you don't agree with them, you have a problem. <laughs> okay? They're going to come get you if you don't agree with them. Now, the interesting thing is that all the churches in the world today agree with the image of the beast. They agree with the beast. 
We're, that's not our subject today. We want to understand this. There's a surprise or two under the subject we're looking at today. In 6T, page 401, God's plan is first to get at the heart. Not the brain first. The heart. All right. Then, don't repeat, repeat what our opponents say. Only speak the truth. All right, now, los, li listen closely. Those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them will, under one pretext or another, go out from us. <laughs> Were you listening? Under one pretext or another, they will leave the Seventh-day Adventist people. It's called independent ministries. Are you listening? Um, under some kind of a pretext. Well, what's a pretext? Well, the Adventist church is Babylon. Oh, the apostate is Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, we're the holy ones. Oh, we're the ones doing it right. Under, these are all pretexts. And God told us under one pretext or another, they will go out from us. Has it happened? Yes. You know, everything God tells us happens. <laughs> we ought to pay attention. When the intercession of Jesus ceases, the next thing in the plan is the wrath of God. Now, there are people who don't like to think about the wrath of God, but that's a fact in the Bible and the spirit prophecy. But something has to happen first. Not having, 6401, not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in the delusions of the enemy, the ones who leave us. They will be taken by delusions of the enemy. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, the true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be for put forth to save the lost. So what's the difference between the ones who leave and the ones that belong to God? They'll put forth efforts to save the lost. That's the difference. The love of Christ, the love of our brethren will testify to the world that we have been with Jesus and learned of him. Then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry and the whole earth will be lightened. The whole earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. When? When the ones are still part of what God called as his people, the remnant, they love God, they love Jesus, they love the brethren. And in that unity, the glory of God lightens the world in that short time of trouble. It can't come any other way. Now, there is a little problem here. It says, according to the things we've seen so far, that latter rain 
will not come when the Seventh-day Adventist church is popular. <laughs> you think it's going to come tomorrow? <laughs> it's impossible. Jesus has told us. The power that he is going to give his people to the third angel's message, to the people who love each other and who love God, it can't happen while the church is popular. <laughs> There's going to be a crisis. We will no longer have our big hospitals. We will not have our equipment, our fancy equipment all over the world. We will not have our Bible houses, our supplies. We won't have our church programs. As a matter of fact, the organization could be in pretty bad shape by itself. I don't know how much of it's going to be left. But the Spirit of Prophecy does give us some pretty good hints. In 5T463, the work which the church has failed to do, the what? It didn't say the meetings we held. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say the camp meetings we had. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say all the all the food bazaars we had. It doesn't say any of that. It doesn't say our socials. It says the work. That's what God is focused on. That's what Jesus is focused on. That's what Christianity is focused on. The work. The work that the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis. A terrible crisis. That's a nice, happy time. Everybody's smiling. Everybody having a good time. It says, a terrible crisis. There's nothing fun about it. At that time, the superficial, conservative, class whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies toward whom their sympathies have been long intending. Now I want you to understand this with me. The superficial conservative class the ones that never been, they always had to have it the same, always. What they were taught when they first became Seventh-day Adventists, that's what they believe and they never will believe anything because they have never studied for themselves. The ones who aren't listening to God and to hear the Spirit of Jesus himself and learn what the truth is, is they're going to hold with, the, with hold with what they were taught. They will leave God's people. They will renounce the true faith of God. The superficial conservative ones, the hold to the old things they were taught. They don't move. And everybody has to believe it. They we the way they believe it, or they're not happy. These apostates, I'm reading, these apostates will then manifest the most bitter enmity. They're bitter. It's the first thing you notice about the people who leave Seventh-day Adventism to form their own group. They always start sounding bitter against the true people of God. 
There's no love there. It's always, look what they're doing what wrong, what they're doing wrong in the Adventist church. During this time, God's true people, and we're not ready to talk about how they get ready for this yet. The people of God, the members of the church, will be individually tested. They're going to walk in this church one Sabbath and take the whole group and say, now, now let's test you. No, let's say it individually. You're going to be by yourself. And what's going to happen? They will be placed in circumstances where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. They're not going to be looking for it. They're not saying, bring it on, I'll testify about Jesus. No, they're going to drag you and say, let's hear if you're a Christian or not. A real Bible Christian. And where are you going to be placed? They'll be called to speak before councils, courts of justice, pastor perhaps separately and alone. Are you ready for that? For the law, come to you and say, you say a Seventh-day Adventist, you come over here. No church members, no pastors, nobody else, just you all by yourself. <laughs> and we're going to see who you really are. But before that comes, you see, we're going backwards at this. <laughs> In Great Controversy, page 48, I'm not using any quotations. You all know, you've heard these, but I'm trying to put them in a different frame to understand what's being said here. Great Controversy 48. There's another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches of today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now the Spirit of Prophecy is closing a fact, not something that could happen to some of the people of God. It says, all who live as Jesus means for Christians to live will, point blank, no other choices, will suffer in per persecution. Why is it then, I'm quoting again, that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber. The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. Is this church awakening any opposition to what it's doing? Is anybody in Portland saying, watch out for those people over there? I almost said on Sandy, but I guess it's not Sandy. It's another street. I don't even know the name. <laughs> but he said, those people who go there every Sabbath, do they awake an opposition and say, those people are dangerous. They're terrible people. Why are why aren't they saying it? <laughs> the religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. Now, this is what God says. I'm not saying these things. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the Word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church, and the spirit of persecution will be revived, and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. So why don't we have any persecution? I think it's pretty clear. 
Nobody in the world cares about us. We're not making any noises. We, we look just like them. We buy the same thing they buy. We're amused by the same thing they're amused at. We laugh at the same jokes they laugh at. We don't do any more soul winning than they do. Why should they care? <laughs> now these pages are very important. You have the books at home and that's what they say in your books. Testimonies to Ministers, page 300. Let me tell you, the Lord will work in this last work, that's the latter rain experience, in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. No, I think it's a nice thing to do some planning. But God is not going to finish this according to our plans, according to our organization, according to the things we want to put together. God is going to do it a different way. The workers will be surprised by the simple means he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. The people who are actually working are going to be surprised. That's what it says. The ones who are trying to do something, they're going to be surprised the way God does it. Well, if they're going to be surprised, it must mean the way we're doing it isn't the way God does it. We get so proud about our soul winning ventures. Well, I'm glad we're doing something. <laughs> but we, we better watch out because if we get content because we're doing something, we still aren't doing what God said to do. We're a people basking in prosperity. That's right. That's us. We have money in the bank. We have a job. We have material things. We're in great shape financially and materially. You want food? You know right where the store is. <laughs> What's the big deal? You just go down there and you buy some. But there's coming a time, we've heard, we're not only not going to have a job, <laughs> we're not going to have any money, and you can't buy food without money. And all of a sudden, we're going to be out there in the store, it doesn't matter. They're not going to let you in there. The organization is not going to hold us up. The pastor is not going to have any significant input for you anymore when you're not seeing him anymore. The church, they're going to close the churches. And I have asked many pastors, what are you going to do when this hits? 10% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> Who's going to pay you to be a pastor? <laughs> Will you still be a pastor when you have to depend on God only and nothing else? The organization is going down as far as financial security. It's going to go down. It can't support pastors anymore at the scale that we're used to. Pastors have it very good right now, and I'm glad they do. They get their houses paid for. They get their houses paid for. They get the insurance paid for. They get... Their education paid for for the children, they get paid, they really live quite well. But 10% of nothing is nothing. That day is coming. 2SM58, it says, under the showers of the latter rain, the inventions of man, that's organization, the inventions of man, the human machinery will at times be swept away. Now, we need organization. We ought to hold on to it as long as we can. But there's a time coming when we're not going to have it anymore. That time is the latter rain. 
Now, I hope you're paying attention to all of this because we ought to be asking the question, how in the world do you get ready for that time? <laughs> That's what I want to try to answer today. Contrary to any human planning, Jesus says, My spirit, Zechariah, not by the power of man, not by your machines, not by anything you do. It will happen by my spirit. Zechariah 4, 6. It's not going to come under human leadership. It's going to come under the leadership of Jesus himself to his people. 5T, page 82. God will work in our day in a way that few anticipate. He will raise up and exalt among those who are taught rather by the unction of His Spirit than by the outward training of scientific institutions. That includes seminaries. Okay? Well, I'm glad there are some men who have been to the seminary. I have been there, I have to tell you. The Lord had to take a lot of it out of me before <laughs> He could use me in any basis. God is going to take people from the plow, we're told. Are you at the plow? I think you are. It may not be the same kind of plow farmers use, but you're out there working, doing something. And before we get down to this latter rain experience, he's going to tell you, I want you spending full time working for me. You know how to earn money so that you can eat. Well, you may still have to do some of that. But doing my work is going to become first in your life. And everything else is going to be second. On that same uh, page, 5T82, she says, there are few really consecrated men among us. Is that true or isn't it? You know, Seventh-day Adventists don't like to hear these kinds of things. People, oh, you're being negative. I'm not being negative. This is God talking. <laughs> he says there are very, there are few. To me, that means there are few. That doesn't mean there's bunches and bunches of consecrated people among us. This is a few. There are few really consecrated men among us. Few who have fought and conquered in the battle with self. Real conversion is a decided change of feelings and motives. It is a virtual taking leave of worldly connections. Of what? Yeah, it means you're no longer hooked up with the world. You've turned your back on it. And it means if you have friends who are worldlings and are not Christians, there's only one reason you should be with them. That's to try to help them become Christians. But if you hang around with worldlings and you enjoy the same thing they do, you have a major problem. There's a withdrawing from, from the controlling power of their thoughts. Now let me hit below the belt. Do you have a television set? Do you ever turn it on? Guess whose thoughts you're getting. Think about it. Do you think that's Jesus talking truth to you through that boob tube? There's something wrong somewhere, isn't there? It seems to me that once you know it's the devil talking to you through that thing, that it ought to hit. Those thoughts that are hitting me are not from Jesus. It's that simple. That's what she just said here. There must be a withdrawing from the controlling power of their thoughts, their opinions, and the influences. 
the separation causes pain. Oh, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> pain. You mean I just don't shut it off and throw the thing out and say, wonderful? It says pain. <laughs> so if you ever get to that place, it is the variance which Christ declares he came to bring. But the converted will feel a continual longing desire that their friends shall forsake all for Christ. How can you ask your friends to forsake all for Christ if you're not? And you know it. <laughs> Are you beginning to catch a picture why there are so many few, or so, how many few, how many of our people, our soul winners? She said, few consecrated. Why is it so hard for our brother to fill this church with Seventh-day Adventists to go out and beat the bushes and learn how to witness for Jesus? Well, brother, here it is. Here's why. This is why. And I'm not afraid to tell anybody this. We need to wake up. We need to wake up. Seventeen thirty-three. Are you ready for a few hard statements now? <laughs> yeah, we've just play, been playing the easy ones. Do you want to start hearing some of the good ones? This is straight out of the mind of Jesus. This is his spirit talking to us. This is the testimony of Jesus. What the Lord did for his people in that time, it is just as essential and more so that he do for his people today. All that the apostles did, every church member today is to do. I don't know how many members are in this church. I haven't been here on a Sabbath morning. But every single one of those, every single one of those, according to Jesus, is to do what the apostles did. That says every. Now I'm going to say something very difficult to you at this point. Everybody who comes to church here is not a member of God's church. Only the people who do what he says are a part of his church. The rest of them are doing something else. Now, I have to tell you this. Most of them don't know they're not doing what Jesus said. Nobody's telling them. I was a pastor for several years, and I never said these things to my people because I didn't know them. <laughs> so I know what happens. I didn't know. I had to go back and apologize to lots of people after I woke up and began to see some of this. That was in 1733. I don't know if I told you the page. You want to hear it again? All the apostles did. Every church member today is to do. Uh, we're now we're starting to get a hold of who is going to receive the latter rain. We're beginning to say, see who the real church is. All right, let's think about it for a moment here. When the apostles went out, and, I, I, and I'm only going to get halfway through today. When the apostles went out, what technology did they have? 
Foot power. <laughs> that was our technology. <laughs> they didn't have computers. They didn't have, they didn't have radios. They didn't have television. They didn't. In one generation, they got it done. And God is going to give us one generation to get it done without all that stuff. I'm going to tell you point blank. I'm not going to try to prove anything to you. You cannot convert a person who is watching those lights giving them information. You cannot do it. The Spirit doesn't work that way. Because those lights coming into your brain bypass all of your filters. The brain has no place for those lights to come because it can't sort them out. It just puts them somewhere. All those lights become random information in your brain, and you can't even control them after they're there. They're there. They come up whenever the brain decides to bring them up. So when they see George Vandeman come into the brain, the only thing the brain gets is George Vandeman. He gets nothing about Jesus. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about what that, the technology of that television is. I, that's not our subject today. But I want you to know, the devil knows what he's doing, and he knows how to trick the Seventh-day Adventist people. We need to think of how did the apostles get it done. They got it done. God has told us we're going to get it, going to get it done the same way. The same way. What did they have? They had Pentecost. <laughs> they had Pentecost. Maybe that's what we're missing. Nothing happens until you get Pentecost. How did they get Pentecost? Go back and read Acts of the Apostles. Those early chapters about the Spirit of God. Read them carefully because we're misreading a lot of it. It says the first thing they did, Jesus put them together. And they had to learn how to live with each other first. <laughs> yeah. Ten days. Have you ever lived with somebody for ten days, 120 somebodies, and nobody took a shower? <laughs> You know what they had to do? They learned it right away. You know, I can't sit here and argue about theology with this guy. We'll never get through 10 days. <laughs> the first thing they had to do was give up pride of opinion. They had to learn how to love each other. And when they learned to love each other and they gave up pride of opinion, they found out something. They had one thing they all wanted to do. Reflect Jesus to the world. Then Pentecost. <laughs> and what was Pentecost? God himself came and filled them with his life. No theology. Himself. They were awaited. Desire of Ages 8.27. They were awaited with the burden for the salvation of souls. They were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. That was them. That was Christianity to them. Talks about the Spirit being poured out. And it says so... It may be now, instead of men's speculations, let the word of God be preached. Let Christians put away their dissensions and give themselves to God for the saving of the lost. That's the lot of rain, isn't it? 
That's all Christians do in the latter rain. There's nobody who gets the latter rain that does anything else. That's what they do. Give themselves to God entirely without any reserve for the saving of the lost. Are you starting to get the picture? In order to get to the latter rain, you have to have the early rain. And that's what the early rain is. Is giving yourself to God for the saving of the lost. If you don't do the early rain, no latter rain. Don't even think about getting the latter rain if you're not doing the early rain. The outpouring of the Spirit in apostolic days was the former rain, and glorious was the result, but the latter rain will be more abundant. More abundant than what the apostles did. That's right. Is that what we see around us today? <laughs> Come on. Nobody in their wildest dreams thinks we're doing what they did. Somewhere in great controversy, it talks about primitive godliness. Primitive godliness. We're not going to have any paid evangelism during that time. We're not going to have any paid evangelistic advertising. It's going to be you wandering around by yourself talking to somebody that the Spirit has already prepared. And you will have something to say because you will have the Spirit in you. <laughs> the Spirit of Jesus doing the same thing in you that it does in him. And you know what happens when a person com becomes converted to Jesus? Every person who is converted to Jesus Christ becomes a missionary. Everyone, every true convert, that is. Doesn't she say it? Every person born into the kingdom of God is born as a missionary. Yeah, it's in the book Evangelism. Every, do you like those words? Every, each, any, all. <laughs> Nobody's left out. <laughs> I noticed it a long time ago that God doesn't leave any holes so you can sneak out and say, well, I'm different. <laughs> you better not be different. <laughs> Great Controversy, page 612. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. No less. As a matter of fact, it's going to be more. How close are we getting to that? <laughs> more power than when the apostles were on the earth. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. What are they doing? Potlucks. What a shame. What a disgrace to think that's the way they spend their time. They're moving around all over the place by the thousands. To win somebody to Jesus, to, to warn the people, to save them from their perdition. They're perishing. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders follow the believers. So, Will all people who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists have this experience? We know it's not possible. So we can't go out there and say, well, that half of the church will in this one. No, this is the only one that counts right here. Am I going to have this? You worry about yourself. I'll pray for you, but I can answer it for me. <laughs> we need to settle this. Theology, okay. I don't believe theologians are going to heaven, but that's all right. If people want to believe in theolo theology, that's up to them. Yeah. 
You know, the book, Mount of Blessings, page 2, it, the book begins by saying, Jesus first cleanses the soul temple that he may inhabit it. Well, I want to keep those words just the way they read. I want him to cleanse my soul temple so he can come live in me. Jesus. Amen. I don't know how he does it. And I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> All I know is the Bible and Spirit prophecy say, he comes. That's enough for me. There's going to be a shaking. We read that. They're going to forsake the faith. The superficial conservative people in the church, the ones who want to keep everything level, oh, don't shake the boat, don't rock it, no, don't do that. Don't you say something that will get that church across the street mad at us. In Testimonies to Ministers 507, the people who are in this church and in every Seventh-day Adventist church in the world, including the city where I live, when the Spirit of God comes, the real thing, not their theology, they will not recognize it. They won't even know what's happening. Do you want to hear that? Testimonies to Ministers 507. Many, in great measure, failed to receive the former rain. Now, here's the problem. We're not going to get to it today, what that means. I didn't realize I'd brought so many quotations together this morning. <laughs> they have not obtained all the benefits God has provided for them. They expect, okay, here's one of the problems. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. And so we have all kinds of members in our midst who think that what they don't have now, they're going to get at the latter rain. What a horrible surprise they're going to get. It's not going to happen. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making a terrible mistake. Oh, someday when it's time, here I am, Lord, use me. <laughs> Too late? Too late? Every individual must realize his own necessity. The heart must be emptied of every defilement and cleansed for the indwelling of the Spirit. That's my blessing page too. There it is again. She talks about Pentecost. She says the same work only in greater degree must be done now. What greater work? Stop having wars over theology. Love each other. Have just one purpose, to exalt Jesus. And it says we need this more than they needed it back then. Um, I've got to get to the punchline here. We all know these little platitudes. If you don't live up to the present light, the light you have, then you're getting new light. We all know that one. Well, let's change the wording. If you don't have the early rain, why should God give you the latter rain? What good would it do? <laughs> Nobody is going to get the latter rain who isn't living the latter rain experience already, and now he just magnifies it to get the work done quickly. Doesn't it say 1911, the final movements would be rapid ones? That's why the latter rain, it brings that germination. All the work God's done in the world, all the work he's done in you as a person, he brings it all to a head, and here's the fruit. 
But you can't have fruit if you don't have a plant. <laughs> we have been looking at the wrong direction. The early rain is today. <laughs> don't be looking for the latter rain. You look the wrong direction if you do. The early rain is right now. Whatever the latter rain requires, it's today before the event. Every saint, fearless of consequences, followed the convictions of his own conscience and united with those who were keeping all the commandments of God. And with power, they sounded abroad the third message. I saw this message will close with power and strength far exceeding the midnight cry. Why? What she said earlier in early writings, they had the armor <laughs> from head to foot. And they were fearless. And they went out to speak the word from heaven. Nothing could stop them. And they had double the angels to help them. <laughs> well, I don't know how to wrap up what I wanted to do because I'm only halfway done here. Ah. Where are we here? Only those who are living up to the light will receive greater light. See? Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. So we can miss the whole thing and not even know what's happening because we don't know what the early rain is. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Now, I'm going to read you a hard one. Testimonies to Ministers 508. It's on the next page. Many people never get to the next page. I've heard people quote the one on 507, but I've never heard anybody quote the one on the next page. I always go to the next page, okay? On 508 it says, If we do not progress, if we do not place ourselves in an attitude to receive both the former and the latter rain, we shall lose our souls. See, there's more to this than saying, well, I'm too busy for that. I can't do it. I'm just a church member. No. Every person in the Adventist church, every baptized person needs to be with that brother helping him do the work. Every single one. And they ought to know that if they don't get over there and do something in the spirit of Jesus, they're going to get themselves lost. Now you go read the page. I didn't make it up. It's right there in everybody's books. Now I don't know about you, but that thought just shakes me with terror to think that after hearing everything Jesus had tried to tell me and all the experiences, that I could lose it because I'm into potlucks instead of winning souls. Two S M fifty seven. But should the Lord work upon men as he did on the day after Pentecost? 
many who now claim to believe the truth would know so very little of the operation of the Holy Spirit that they would cry, beware of fanaticism. The church members saying to the ones who are catching on to what Jesus is saying, oh, a fanatic, look, a fanatic. They would say of those who were filled with the Spirit, these men are full of new wine. I can't finish. I have to wait till next time to go through some more of this. But we have done enough today so you recognize the people who are going to go through the latter rain experience are those who have the early rain experience and they just continue through doing what they're doing. Only God now gives them power to get it done quickly, to finish the work. How does a person live that's living in the early rain? They, they have this burden for souls that never goes away. They love what Jesus loves. Jesus loves all the human beings you'll ever come in contact with. He expects you to do something for them. Now, obviously, not everybody's going to respond to it. But we need to try. We need to do something. We can't just say, oh, that one's no good. They'd never listen to me. How do you know? <laughs> You don't know. None of us know. I'll close with this. I'll, I'll probably off the tape. That's okay. There was a fellow in San Bernardino. I responded because, and she wasn't even his wife. He was living with this woman. She wanted to know something about the Bible, living with this fellow. So I went to the home, and I asked her if that was her. And she said, yes. I said, well, I'd like to give you a Bible. I would like to uh, answer any questions you have. Uh, and I realize you have an interest. Uh, would your husband have an interest also? And she said, well, I'm not married. And there he sat over there in the corner. <laughs> and he was sitting there all scruffy. I never saw a scruffier person. He had what used to be a white T-shirt. It wasn't white anymore. <laughs> he, was, he was like this. He was, had beard just sticking out in all sort of places. He was bald-headed. He had no hair on his, up there, but he had him here. He had a big cigar in his face. And he was about three feet away from the television set, looking like this, sitting in the corner. So I said, well, uh, she said that's not her husband. So I said, well, whoever he is. I said, do you mind if I ask him? She said, no, come on in. So I went in. And she said, he won't talk to you. I said, okay. So I stood next to him and I said a few words. He never moved. <laughs> His eyes never, never blinked. <laughs> and I said, ah, oh, this is going to be a little tougher than I thought. So I mentioned that uh, this young lady has asked for a Bible and I'm happy to come and answer any questions. Does he have any questions? He never moved. So I said, you know, this is not going to go down like this. <laughs> so I stepped between him and the television set. <laughs> he looked at me. He finally looked up. He said, you think you're smart, don't you? <laughs> I said, no, I don't think I'm smart. I just wondered if you could see anything besides the television set. I'm talking to you. <laughs> he said, I don't want any. I said, okay. I said, that's fine. You answered my question. I said, I'm, I'm going to come back and talk to her. She wants to know about the Bible. No problem. I said, have you ever been to church? He said, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it doesn't seem like there's much church there. Have you ever been to church? He said, I'm a Catholic. I said, oh, that answers the question for me. I said, I'll tell you what. The next time you go to church, you ask the minister this question. And I'm going to tell you his answer. And he said, what? You can't do that. I said, yeah, I can do that. You ask him this question, and this is what he's going to say to you. And so I left. I came back a week later to begin her studies. 
And he came to the door with her and he said, how did you know? <laughs> how did I know what? What he was going to say. <laughs> I said, he said it, didn't he? He said, yeah. I said, I'll tell you how come I know, but you're going to have to listen to what the Bible says first. He said, okay. So we sat around and we had some, and little by little, they began to get it. And I finally asked the question, you people are living together without marriage, aren't you? And they said, yeah. I said, you know what? We're going to have to stop these studies because God doesn't play games. If you're just wanting information, that's not going to work. If you want to know what God says and you want something in your life about God, you're going to have to break this up. You have to live separately. And I left. <laughs> I came back the next week. And sure enough, he had moved out. But he was there for the study. <laughs> so we continued the studies. And the day came when I had to leave that part of the world. And I told them, I can't give you any more, but I want somebody else to follow through with this. I'll have somebody here, and they'll answer your questions the same way as I have. No problem. But I won't be able to come anymore. So I left. Years later, four or five, maybe six years later, I was back in that part of the world having a meeting in one of the big auditoriums down there. And after the meeting... This dapper individual came up with his nice hat with a small brim, beautiful trimmed mustache and beard, nice coat, well-pressed seam in his shiny shoes, and he came up to me, and he says, hello. I said, who's this? <laughs> now, I have had hundreds of meetings, and I've met thousands of people, and I can remember most of them. I did not know who this person was. <laughs> And I said, oh, oh, what am I going to say to him? I don't know who he is. <laughs> and he looked at me and says, you don't know me, do you? I said, well, brother, you got me. I don't know who you are. I just can't put it together. I can't put together the meeting, that time, nothing. He says, well, there's a reason. I'm the guy that was sitting in front of the television set with the cigar. <laughs> the Lord got a hold of him, baptized him, cleaned him all up. He was a soul winner now. They were married. Amen. It was just a beautiful thing to see him. I said, no, I didn't recognize you. I can honestly say, there's no way I can recognize you after you tell me. <laughs> so don't think you can figure out the person you can talk to and say, oh, they'll never listen. They don't know any. They don't want to know. Yeah, I've seen it too many times how God turns around the ones nobody would talk to. <laughs> Yeah, talk to everybody. <laughs> Wait and see. And even if you don't see results, you might strike up something that will make them curious to have somebody else talk to them. See? It all works. All right. We'll do some more next, week, next time. Is that prayer? Father, we thank you that you didn't Cut us out because we didn't show much promise. We weren't too bright when you came to us. We didn't know anything. But because you love us, you weren't going to give up. You had somebody talk to us, and we're so thankful somebody did. We're so thankful that your spirit never let us go. You spoke to us. You put something in us that we wanted to know. And we thank you that you brought us the light, the light of your kingdom, the light of your grace, and that we have responded to you. Help us to remember that we're no better than all the people we see out there who still don't know you. We're still no better. Only Jesus is better. In that last moment on this earth, when we still have awareness, we will see it so clearly we have no merits. Our only hope is Jesus. Help us, Lord, not to get lost in the doctrines. Help us to share that wonderful life, that precious blood with people. And let him deal with it with them. We thank you for all the knowledge and information you have given us. Now help us by your spirit to move forward and to live it, and to be a spectacle to the world and to the angels.